Hello and welcome once again to episode 129 of Code Completion. We're a group of iOS developers and educators hoping to share what we love most about development, Apple technology, and completing your code. My name is Dimitri and I'll be your host once again for this episode and I'm joined today by my fellow completionist, Spencer. Hey there. Uh, so we are back this week with some Swift Evolution updates, uh, namely uh, that Observation is out for review. So we talked a little bit about this in the past. Uh, it basically allows you to, in a Swift native way, uh, register for updates on on different properties and different different structs and stuff like that, and let you observe changes. Uh, and it delivers this via a new um, the new async sequences uh, API, uh, which makes it very different to consume, but very natural once you do get used to it. It's uh, get used to writing infinite loops uh kind of kind of feeling which it always felt wrong yeah uh but uh this is this is clearly a better pattern than anything we had because it is type checked by the compiler um and it's going to make sure that you don't do anything stupid in the process uh like write an infinite loop i think you can still write infinite loops and it will never know um i've never i haven't actually tried i don't know see I mean, if it will let you write an infinite loop nowadays yeah. i just like don't bother attempting it. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've definitely like recursively called a function over and over and it'll crash eventually, but I don't know about like an infinite loop. So interesting. Yeah, uh, yeah loops are reminding me uh, in TypeScript and uh, JavaScript, uh, you have a for n, which seems like that's what everyone else uses, but you're not supposed to use it. That, that one's the bad one. Uh, instead, you have to use for of. What? <laughs> and this is wonderful. Mm. But basically, uh, if you use for in on your array, that's going to work fine until someone decides to modify the prototype of array, which it turns out a whole bunch of libraries do, uh, and add like useful helper functions to mm. all arrays, uh, because that's something that you can do in a dynamic language that doesn't care too much about how it's used. Uh, and therefore, your for loop is now going to iterate over those methods as well. <laughs> uh, oh. Because javascript uh so yeah don't use for ends use for ofs um because that's a it's a wonderful it's a wonderful world world using that language anyways uh back to back to better languages uh we have observation uh it's out for review go check it out go leave your comments go uh have an opinion uh yep. because it looks like it's going to make it in before dub dub yeah it's super cool this this uh, it goes through I'm sh I'm sure we've already talked about this, but it goes through the, sort of the existing uh, mechanisms for ob observation of this pattern of some type, like KBO observable object, um, and it, it sort of talks about you know what does this sort of provide a better uh, method of of accomplishing that same thing. One thing I think that's really cool is it's just. You can just do at observable on the type and everything within it, it becomes observable instead of you having to do like at published on every single uh, uh, property or whatever. And it also mm -hmm. will work on computed properties, which is huge because you couldn't do that. Um, you can't do that as far as I know with uh, published variables. It just won't even compile. So they're using macros to just make this automatic conformance uh, to make this all happen. happen. So it's... Um, really cool and yeah like the i agree that the infinite for loop feels a little bit weird for now but you know uh, so did codable when it came out so uh mm -hmm. to me at least so uh i'm sure that we'll get used to it and this feels like a very kind of uh how would i say it like well-rounded or just kind of like a complete like it feels like it's filling in what little things didn't quite work with the existing solutions and you know mm -hmm. kbo is kind of a mess to deal with i don't personally like using kbo so uh this is i think a little bit more user friendly too yeah kbo is definitely something from uh, it requires a, a fully dynamic language which swift does not uh swift is optimized by the compiler to not be dynamic most of the time uh and that is one of the shortcomings of it uh, so although we do have a nicer KVO in Swift, uh, this is like the ultimate form yeah. um, that should appease to everyone. It uh, doesn't mean that you can observe anything willy-nilly uh, because it does depend on like having types be marked um, and tagged appropriately so that way they can emit this code, basically. Um, 
So that is one consideration. You can't abuse this like you can KVO to access private properties. Yeah. Um, but it's it's overall going to be a much more performant and much better solution. Um, and like you said, it's it's using macros which are also coming that are gonna it's gonna be a whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, like there's a I, I think I forget exactly what it's called, but I think it's called async async algorithms. Um, is a package that Apple uh, also has open sourced, uh, which is basically the replacement for Combine the framework. Um, so all the throttles, all the this is and all that the did not last long. Um, well, it lasted a few years, but uh, <laughs> if you're writing in Objective C, you can still use Combine. If you are writing entirely in Swift, which it seems like the writing may be on the wall for Objective C, is in Apple as well. Uh, then that's like this is going to be the new way forward. Yeah. Um. And yeah, I welcome it. It's it's looking it's looking really cool to use. Yeah. Uh, what else is also cool is uh, C gets true and false statements and a couple other things. That's cool. It's an official true and false this time. Yeah. Uh. Don't don't let those ones and zeros confuse <laughs> you. Uh. So to give context to, to those who don't know, uh, C has this wonderful uh, way of interpreting everything as uh, as as numbers uh, at the end of the day. Um, and this includes like your regular numbers, one, two, three, four, zero, true and false expressions. Uh, those all get boiled down to a true or false statement uh, when you when you check a condition for it. Uh, this much in the way of JavaScript uh, is a great way of shooting yourself in the foot, um, especially when you want to check, hey, do I have a number? And it's zero, and zero is not a number. Sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, unlike in JavaScript, where not a number is not a number and all the, all the fun hijinks that you can get from that. Uh, but C is just as bad. Uh, Swift, you don't have this problem. If you have a number, you just can't compare it. Like You can't just say if my number and do something it's going to say what do you want to do do you want to compare smaller than equal than uh do you want to do something with this but by itself it's not enough even optionals not enough you need to say it's equal to nil or you need to do an if let to explicitly unwrap it and then you can go ahead and do something so um c is not playing catch up to any of that (laughs) it just added some statements for uh true and false uh and no pointer uh because that's useful. Uh, oh, I forgot. Pointers are also numbers, um, and arrays are just math on numbers. It, it's <laughs> it's a whole thing. Um, numbers all the way down. Um, but yeah, I, I I don't know what else to say That's about cool. C. It exists. Yep. It's a thing. It remains a product in our. <laughs> I'm glad I don't have to use it on the daily. Yeah, that would be a nightmare. Uh, much like using JavaScript. Um, But what isn't a nightmare uh, is Apple savings accounts are now uh, becoming a thing, and it's surprisingly good. Yeah, I'm quite surprised and honestly uh, very tempted to move my uh, banking over to this. I mean, it's Goldman Sachs under the hood, but it's, you know, this Apple Card thing. Uh, Mostly because it offers a high-yield APY of... 4.15%, 4.15%, which is more than 10 times the national average. Uh, that's pretty nuts on a savings account. That's like, I don't know, I haven't looked into it in a while, but that's like CD levels of, of uh, uh, interest. So that's pretty cool. Um, and of course, it's you know just a part of your the wallet app and everything. So I, I remember uh, when I was... When I was a, a kid, uh, I wrote my first app. Uh, it was Elements. Uh, put it on the App Store. Made a small fortune uh, a child should never make on their own. Um, <laughs> and my my mom, not knowing what to do with a child that made too much money, uh, is like, you should go ahead and open a CD account. Yeah. You basically put money in there and you can't touch it for a year uh, or like more. Or like Yeah, it's more s- usually. Several okay. years, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, three years. Uh, and you'll make two percent per year. Yeah. And I I put ten thousand dollars in there. And when I when I pulled it out at the end, I was 
not really impressed at yeah. the end of the day because yeah. it, it grew by two percent a year which is not I, yes it's it's a significant amount of money but it was not an appreciable amount of money for a, a child that made too much money sure uh so uh that that was my experience with cd accounts as an adult though i am looking at my bank account and calculating 4.15 percent and that looks wonderful um <laughs> yeah so <laughs> that is uh something that i am also uh contemplating because my current bank also, i don't think uh, namely it's a checking account which has different uh restrictions on it sure uh, i don't think i need it to be a checking account like i have not i guess i have written a few checks from it uh so that is a thing but like it, it has not gotten very much in terms of yeah uh any interest over the years yeah so it kind of kind of interesting i uh I don't know. It's kind of like a power play. Uh, interested to see if it stays that way, I suppose. Uh, it gets a pretty gnarly percent. I wonder how they're doing that. If it's just they're kind of relying on Apple. Uh, I think they're just bankrupting Goldman Sachs. <laughs> For real? Though, which I, <laughs> maybe wouldn't be the worst thing, I guess. But uh, yeah, interesting. So uh, yeah, I don't know if it's available now. Oh, it is available now. Oh. Okay, I'll have yeah, to check it out. Th cool. This today, today. Um, so hot bang, I, yeah. All right. I guess there's no harm in in opening an account. Yeah, um, yeah, except, for sure. Uh, I'm hoping that because Apple has been very uh, makes made it very easy for anyone to open a Apple card, like um, like the application card. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they made it very easy to apply um and i'm hoping that they do the same thing for this because for a lot of people it's almost impossible oh. to open a bank account yeah that's true um just because of like one thing that happened in their past uh and that can like be a huge problem for many many things uh because it, it of course cascades from there so um i'm hoping this is uh, this becomes an easy way for folks to open an account um and like goldman sachs ain't going anywhere yeah uh, and if they do it seems like the federal government will definitely be able to bail mm. <laughs> uh bail things out um uh, hoping uh but we'll see um but yeah uh that's 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 it's definitely interesting to see where this is going i wonder if apple will be forever reliant on goldman sachs right or are they going to start like they, using their existing cash to they, yeah they could the totally stuff. open a bank and just like it's probably easier for them to just do it through goldman sachs and i'm sure it's just a few trillions right <laughs> yeah but like i mean it is <laughs> apple we're speaking about it wouldn't be out of the question for them to just be like yeah we're just gonna open the bank of apple the old boa and uh call it good <laughs> boa yeah so, so i think I, I think an existing boa would have some <laughs> they'll just buy the Some trademark up. for you know <laughs> a trademark. cool five billion or whatever i don't know dude they'd do it a, the the way until boa is uh is in in deep financial straits and then they'll they'll offer them a, a way out oh it's bank of america that's why you're, yeah okay i didn't think of like <laughs> i was like if it's a random bank what oh it's bank of america my bad okay Oh, I thought you were going. No, nope, no, nope. <laughs> no, nope, nope. Didn't even think about Bank of America. <laughs> Didn't even think about it. <laughs> nope. Uh, okay, so hot off the heels of last week, we talked about uh, I think Rivian and Tesla uh, being just like uh, not interested in CarPlay. They're doing their own thing. No, GM. Oh, GM. GM Sorry, was yes. like we want to track people, and CarPlay makes that hard. Yeah. Screw you, CarPlay. Yeah. Uh, Ford is like, yeah, we're gonna commit to doing it. Uh, <laughs> they're they're on the CarPlay bandwagon, which is sweet and I, kind of ironic because I was bashing Ford for not uh, for my well, my mom's car is old enough that it. CarPlay, I don't think, was even a thing when she bought it. But uh, they're con they're committing to continue uh, supporting CarPlay. And I think adding new features as well with an update for ones that already have it. So that's pretty cool. Um, I'm interested to see where this kind of goes. I think, like we talked about last week, 
uh, or the week before or whatever. Uh, I think CarPlay or Apple's vision for CarPlay is more than just like that single screen, but it kind of encapsulates this whole dashboard and becomes this more uh, integrated part of the car where it can control things like the air conditioning and everything like uh, you can on the Tesla's touchscreen and everything. So that's pretty cool that uh, like a big company like Ford is sort of supporting Apple in that way and making it maybe a possibility in the future for kind of a larger integration. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, did, did Ford commit to making that version of CarPlay available or just the, the current version? No, I, let's see. It, I, I think it's just the current version. I don't think we've heard anything about no, no, I know. the the new version of CarPlay yeah, being on any car. I'm just saying, I feel like if they're committing to kind of continue with Apple and CarPlay, mm-hmm. that could be a possibility in the future. Sorry, I didn't make that. Yeah. Clear. And, and and to and to be extra clear, uh, like it require it does require the automakers to do a little bit more to make this newer version of CarPlay work. It's not just give it more screen and stream to there. Sure. Uh, it's actually make hooks available to uh, the the air conditioning system and all that, so that way it can interact with it. Um, and that adds a whole bunch of complexity that. I'm not sure it's going to be 100% right the first time around. Like, yeah. uh, famously, there there's some, like, weirdnesses with CarPlay. Namely, uh, for instance, my car, uh, fairly recent in terms of, like, capabilities. The steering wheel uh, does not have a way of playing and pausing media. You oh. need to, like, go for the capacitive touch thing yeah. in the corner uh, to, like, play and pause uh, anything. And CarPlay is never going to be able to, like, fix that. Um, and that's an integration the auto manufacturer decided, oh, when we play in pot, we don't want people doing that from their thumb. That would make too much sense. Um, so they're going to need to reach over, uh, get one finger sitting on the corner of the thing so that way they can, like, press it yes. while not looking at the screen. Or just jab at the middle where the big play button might be, depending on which app is open. So, um, <laughs> yeah. It depends which one of us is aiming for it. If, if I'm going, I go for the corner one. If Lynn's going, she goes for the one in the middle of the screen. Uh, but the car, like, shakes. So it's like she misses, and then she pe- taps on something else. It's, yeah. a whole, it's a whole adventure to get the right thing. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's why it would be cool for there to be a kind of a tighter integration of the car's hardware. Because, like, that kind of thing sucks. Uh, it would be nice mm-hmm. to be able to kind of, yeah, I don't know, be cool. So uh, you never put you never put CarPlay in your car, right? No, I just have a like a, a new stereo, a newer stereo that has Bluetooth, so it just connects to my phone. Um, mm-hmm. It's the problem with my car is it's a single like DIN. It's not two, so they do make you car- can't put a screen. Yeah, they do make them. It like comes out and folds up, but they're like. Ooh expensive instead of you know mm-hmm. the cheaper ones that you could get if i had two dins it costs so. more than your car right probably <laughs> yeah it's it's a uh, probably half of my car at that point so uh that said You're raising I, the value of it well yeah i mean i've put like good speakers in in my car and i have a subwoofer in my car as well so like i've made it good for what it is but like it i don't really feel like i'd get that much use or extra value out of my car with carplay like then when I go to buy another car sometime eventually when I run this one into the ground, that'll be my thing is I'll definitely make sure that it has CarPlay. Like we talked about last year, because something, some like very large percentage, like over 50% of people, I think like partially like over 80. Yeah, it was, it was a lot. Like a lot of people partially base their decision on what car to buy by doesn't have CarPlay or Android auto. So, uh, you know, it would be important to me looking in the in into the future, but for now, I'm very happy with my dinky uh, fifteen hundred dollar car. So, yeah, got it. The reason why I was asking is because I have that one of those like wireless adapters. Oh yeah, and it it did two interesting things I did not know about while while purchasing it. The first is it enables the keyboard while driving, which is scary <laughs> uh, because I caught myself like reaching for that once, and I'm like. Mm. I, this is not good for me yeah um so i have i have not used that since uh i realized that it worked uh but yeah it allows the keyboard while driving and the second thing is it 
enables the mode where you can use like button controls to move uh like where your selection is like from the steering wheel like i think it's more specifically from like the stupid little right hand knob in like a mercedes like a oh sure yeah like the little the little mini stick shift for your for your console um like that baloney uh but I don't think my car has any way of controlling it, yet it moves over time. Like, while I'm driving, it'll just, like, click. It's now selecting something else. Click. Oh, that's weird. Now it's selecting something else. And I have no idea why it's or gyro- what is causing it. It's gyroscopic. I'd, I'd bet so my life I thought, on it. I tried. I, I like, jerked <laughs> the car. It did, not, it did not move it. Um, I was kidding, but that's awesome. No, because I was... I. Like I needed to know, yeah. um, and I still I still have not found it out. Interesting. Uh, so I was hoping that you had some experience with one of those little no. gizmos. Um, but yeah, if anyone does have experience with one of those little gizmos, I guess let me know, uh, and I will I will be thankful because I have no clue why that does not work. Weird. Talking about things that uh, don't work uh, yet, and that's because they don't exist yet. Uh, Apple glasses, and these are not the goggles. This right. Is a separate rumor, boys and girls. Uh, these are Apple glasses are coming in 2026. Um, and these uh, make extreme claims because yeah. they don't exist yet. Uh, they make extreme claims that we're not going to get the glare that I enjoy uh, looking at a screen uh, for others to, to see me with. Uh, with my wonderful glare yeah uh, sorry podcast listeners uh <laughs> if to de- describe this in words i am moving my head like an idiot in front of the the webcam and my glasses are just a green yeah. uh veneer on top of my eyes uh because it's reflecting my screen back at me um but it's like tinting them green because i don't know why uh anti-reflective Pretty cool, though. Um, there's kind of a lot of interesting, I think, potential things that they're going to do with this. Um, like Dimitri said, this isn't the like reality pro headset or whatever, but they're just normal glasses. And they sort of talk about like it will probably have face ID. It says that it could have uh, lenses that are thinner than a sheet of paper uh, called meta lenses, which I hate that meta has just uh, ruined that word for everyone. Uh, that's all I think about is just Facebook and I hate it. Um, but yeah, so the, that'll have like camera lenses that are insanely thin. Um, it'll have a dot projector for face ID and stuff. So I don't know. It'd be cool. It'd be like the actual real version of Google glass, which I thought was a cool concept back in the day. Um, I'd buy them. How funny it was that like everyone was so against Google Glass, but now we have like Ray Bans with Snapchat or whatever. Oh yeah, and it's and like no whatever. one cares. Yep. Yeah. It's, uh, They're we, gonna take them into the bathrooms the and, and take videos. Yeah. Yeah. I guess people just take their phones into the bathrooms and take videos anyways. Like you no. see them in front of the camera, in front of the mirrors or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and that kind of ruined that vision for for everyone. Yeah. Um. But yeah, it, it will be very interesting to see when these eventually come out. Um, I know Magic Leap, which was a company that was aiming to make cool uh, glasses, they showed off some cool technology where you don't need to, like it will give you uh, an image that you can focus on using your own eyeballs, which was quite impressive. Yeah. And it did this by projecting a different image on different layers of the lens. Um, oh. So... This allowed essentially uh, your eyes to choose where you wanted to focus because it's essentially projecting different things um, in the distance mm-hmm. uh, for you to observe via these micro prisms. Uh, so I'm I wonder if Apple will have something like that um, because I that definitely does change it from this is just a screen on your face to this is augmenting the world around you in a way that. Uh, is not just 3D, right? And right. the same way that 3D goggles at movies make some people nauseous, it's because you can't really... You are you are not... You don't have the agency over what's being presented. Uh, it's kind of being forced down your eyeballs. Yeah. Um, and that, that agency of being able to focus on different things uh, does improve things drastically. 
on the topic of other uh, things that uh, don't yet exist, uh, this one just came into existence um, because finally, Spencer, you can watch Max on your M2 Max MacBook Pro via your AirPods Max. Yes, all all the things to the this Max. This is not an Apple product. Yeah, this is uh, not an Apple product. Uh, HBO, well, I guess Warner Bros. Discovery, the merger thing, uh, they're just chopping HBO off HBO Max and just saying, yeah, this is kind of a, a cluster. There's a little bit of everything in here, so we're going to drop HBO from it and just call it Max. <laughs> is there so, going to be an HBO channel on Max? Because I feel like the I HBO brand has more value than anything that Warner Bros. Discovery I, is bringing to the table. Yep, um, I know. I don't know, man. Kind of interesting. I mean, I guess it's like, you got last week tonight, and then you've got Shark Week on the same thing, and it's like, what do you call this? And uh, I don't know. So, yeah, uh, they're just going to kind of nix the HBO branding, and I don't know. Uh, interesting. And, you know, they've got different tiers of whatever, ads, not ads, 4K, and everything. So, <sighs> Yeah. I still basically subscribe to HBO and just watch last week's and yep. which I which I haven't even watched recently. Oh, that's uh, good. So I've just been giving them money. Um, so I hope they're giving it to uh, John Oliver for uh, the man. excellent thing that he and his team does. This week's episode of Code Completion is once again brought to you by Super Easy Timer. Super Easy Timer is a quick and easy to use timer app for your Mac. It's complete text based, so you can type in English what you want, twenty minutes or five p.m. Hit enter and instantly start a timer. The timer understands English text to create, update, and start a new timer. You can quickly change an active countdown, even while it's still counting down. There are simple si simple keyboard shortcuts to reset or pause. No menus, no sliders. Just use English to control your timer. We want to thank Super Easy Timer for sponsoring our show. Search for Super Easy Timer on the Mac App Store today to give it a try. So, Spencer, I've got a code completion tip for you. Uh, and this was literally a tip for you as you were asking about something in our uh, private Slack. Uh, and uh, I forget exactly what you're asking, but you wanted a way for something to sit in between private and um, uh, un in internal. With internal, that's the one. I was going to say unlisted, and that's not the one. Uh, but you wanted something that kind of sits in between internal and private yeah um and it turns out there is a way to do this in swift uh and it turns out that this is something that apple makes liberal use of uh to make certain generics available uh to you or uh, to the type system but not really get in the way of programmers using autocomplete um and the way you do this is you can prefix your names or your type names or your methods with an underscore and with this, you would still mark it as internal or public even, um, which is the case in like many SwiftUI classes uh, or structs, I should say. Um, and by putting that underscore there, it will never show up in autocomplete, right. which allows you to go ahead and make this semi-private API available that you basically expect no one's going to make use of. And there's an implicit... Uh, like guarantee that hey if you do use this and it breaks like that's on you that's not on the framework <laughs> author uh, because like how did you even find this you went spelunking to find this kind of right. thing um, so yeah if you ever notice an underscore don't use that thing um, and if you're writing something and you need uh, it to be internal for whatever reason uh, put an underscore in front of it yeah yeah it was a good tip I think what I was doing was I was converting some stuff from objective c over to swift and i had an extension of i think it was like url session delegate and a couple other url session protocols and i wanted to pull those over into a new file and so that's where the thing was i was like if i mark it private it it won't let me access it um but i didn't want to mark it completely internal either because other things even in that module which we we have quite a few modules just didn't need to know about that thing so it was a good uh, middle ground um, and ended up working well. So it was a good tip. Uh, and this week, we actually have a return of the mini review corner. Uh, as Spencer, you bought something quite interesting. Yeah, I, I kind of did a weird thing for me and us, I suppose, just in the, in the space we're in. Um, I've done this once before, so it seems like I'm on about a five or so year cadence of 
buying an Android device, which is very interesting and something I would never really do generally. Uh, but I was looking around and I happened to notice that someone was selling a Surface Duo uh, folding phone for very, very cheap on my local classifieds. So I bought it. Uh, it was kind of an impulse purchase, but I also think I can sell it when I'm kind of done with it. Um, so I have some thoughts on it, both for as a device, not really sort of a review on the device per se, more of a mm -hmm. uh, speculation of what could be to come sort of for the future of uh, mobile devices and just, you know, handhelds in general. So um, I'll kind of go through some pros of the device and then kind of talk about like where it could lead in the future. Um, pros and cons. Pro is that it has two screens and I think it's actually quite an interesting idea so the, the the aspect ratio is really weird it's like five by four or something so it's very wide compared to an iphone let's see if i can get this also on the screen it's like a lot wider so when i uh hold it even you can you know fold it in half and then it just becomes like a single phone it's super wide and that's kind of weird so i'm not sure this exact sort of aspect ratio form factor is like the best like it would have been fun to try um, the, uh, what do they call it? The Samsung Fold, right? That, that mm -hmm. is a little bit more like the aspect ratio of an iPhone. Um, but something that's cool that is like, I've been sort of treating it as like a Nintendo DS basically. And like having it uh, like this, right? So I could have uh, YouTube open on the top screen and then like have Slack open on the bottom and some or something. And it's like very sort of multitaskable. And that's, I think, my favorite thing. And what kind of got me excited about it was it's really nice to like have a full video, like a full YouTube video up, but also be doing something else, checking email, looking at Slack, whatever. And there's not a compromise of like picture in picture. So you're covering up part of the screen or anything. It's just it's two screens. Um, I think a con is like, these are two completely separate screens. So you can, let's see if I, um, it's not like a foldable screen, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there's no like crease in the middle. So, you know, you could have, uh, I'll pull up Slack and, uh, the settings app, right? Like you can have two separate apps open, but also you can say, Oh no, I want this full screen. And it, you know, spans oh, the whole neat. thing. But you if you're looking at something, like, thing. it cuts <laughs> off text, right? So, like, I don't know if the two screens are a good uh, approach to it. I'd rather just have one screen that can actually fold. Um, but this is, like, a cheap way for me to kind of experiment. So, in that sense, I think it would be good to um, have two screens. So, another thing that's great is uh, you can use it, like, you can, you can have it open like this and prop it up on your bed and watch YouTube videos while you're laying in bed and it just stays there and you don't have to hold up your phone. <laughs> like there are some stupid ways that I've been using. That's it. what I use the keyboard cover for. Exactly. Right. Yeah. I don't type with it. I use it as a stand. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> a sideways so, stand. <laughs> it's been fun to just like use the phone as like a phone and not use two screens, but also just like prop it up and like the screen's pretty large. Um, but yeah. Oh, and it's like, let's see. When it's open, the screen is almost as big... Oh, my iPad's dead. But the screen is almost as big as my iPad mini. Like, it's an 8.3-inch screen. It's big. So, again, if there wasn't that uh, black line in the middle because there are two screens, it would be great for watching movies and stuff or reading or whatever. But I guess you could read it as, like, a normal book with two different pieces of paper or whatever. So, um... As a device, the speakers are not great, so I'm constantly reminded that I have to max out the volume on this to even get, like, to half of what my iPhone will do, so not great <laughs> in that sense. You know, it definitely has some some cons. This is the first version. I think they are, there's a, a Surface Duo 2 now, but uh, this thing was, like, $1,200 when it came out, and I got it for 200 so not really, you know, worried about those like the speaker's not working or whatever. It's just been fun to experiment with. It's also insanely thin. Uh, 
I, I don't know if you can tell this, but like, that's the USB-C port. There's no extra room. It's as wide as USB-C port on one screen. It's crazy. I feel like I'm going to break it all the time. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, we, we always complain about how the iPhone is like getting too thin or it's like not thin enough. Uh, no, iPads dude. are one thinner. Uh, yep. And two, uh, if you ever had the chance to pick up an iPod Touch, those things were thin. <laughs> where it yeah. felt like you could snap this in half like a cracker if you sneeze on it wrong. Yeah. Um, and that, that thing looks just as thin. Like you can warp the screen just by like flexing it a tiny bit, I'm sure, right? Yeah, oh, I'm sure I could break this very, very easily. It's not, yeah. I think the, the casing is just aluminum. It's not like, you know, surgical steel or anything, so. Um, but I think what it has done is given me like a, a perspective on uh, folding phones are like not just a fad, I suppose, and that's kind of what I viewed them as before. I was like, I don't really know if I'd enjoy this and this was kind of my chance to see if it would be something that you know if there was an i uh, an iphone version of would i kind of venture out and get it and now i would say yes i definitely would especially if it was one screen not two separate screens um, well there's a lot of advantages to it right like yeah just think about cameras you don't need to have front facing and rear facing cameras if you can flip the camera like yeah. if it's as easy as that you just like look at it from one end and that's that's the that's the selfie and then look at it from the other end and that's uh what it's looking at um i almost wonder like looking at you play with it uh if a trifold would have been better yeah like it gives you a better aspect ratio and then allows you to either open it once or twice uh depending on like how much you want to like view um to get that bigger that bigger uh screen but uh that that black uh rod in the middle is definitely distracting if yeah you it's to bad do anything like even the black screen that you were looking at uh you could still like clearly see yeah. uh the the separation there and i think that's probably just not because it's not using oled right it is actually an OLED. That's the crazy part. So that was that was just like a very gray screen in Slack for yeah, whatever yeah. reason. Yeah, yeah, it's it's AMOLED, but I did I was like watching a YouTube video and I was like, holy crap, this is like really good contrast. And I looked it up. It's it's OLED. It looks really good. Um, so, but yeah, it's grays all over the place. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what what the deal is. They don't have like a you know a true dark or whatever mode. Um, but that exactly what you're talking about with that black line down the screen is like. That's exactly why I've been using it more like a Nintendo TS because I get like two big screens that are enough to do something with and they're even though they're separate it's like they're full screens I suppose I don't know what I'm you know mm -hmm. so it, it's been interesting and I think that I can see Apple doing a much better job than of course this but even like the Samsung ones and everything uh, and I would definitely buy it I'd in the time that I've had it, I've been wanting to use it more and more just because if I'm watching TV or something, I can, you know, pull this up or pull up a YouTube video and then be doing something else and not kind of be limited. So, um, yeah, it's cool. It's uh, the, an interesting look into the future. You mentioning that it's kind of like a Nintendo DS uh, reminded me of the April Fool's Day gag that Game Explain did this year. Uh, where like the Switch to Switch Pro, oh. whatever it's called, got announced, and it's actually has two screens. Um, and for all the joking about that, it's honestly like a, a sound idea. idea. Yeah. Like and Nintendo has made a lot of money selling 3DSs because having two screens was actually quite convenient when you're playing a game. You have one thing free of any HUDs, and then you have a a little side thing uh, to put all your palettes and stuff. Um, I say palettes and stuff as if I still use uh, Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop on a, yeah. uh, Apple Quadra. Um, but nice. the, like that's what you would get a second <laughs> yeah. screen for back in the day is to put your palettes. There that's wasn't enough resolution for anything else. You have your nice big one uh, for your document and then like all the extra little things that Adobe would uh, like throw in your face. You put them all in another monitor um because that was more efficient 
um, even though your desk now had zero space on it because you had two hunkin' monitors yeah. on it. Um, but like going back to, to the 3DS, uh, like the Wii U, as yeah. much as we like to, to hate on it, like <laughs> as a kid, I would have loved the Wii U. It's like you're playing your game, your parents come, they want to watch something. Well, you just take your game with you and you move somewhere else. Um, and like the switch ultimately became that yeah. the, the best evolution of that. Um, but being able to play the switch where you have the screen in your hand and you're still looking at something on the TV, that would be a truly magical experience. Um, that is kind of in the same vein, right? To have two screens to do two different things. Um, even if they're not linked together. Right. Yeah. I mean, we have multiple monitors or stupid wide monitors just i mean for that reason because one isn't enough i think it's a very transferable idea to phones and having them be foldable is really cool because this is like really wide i don't know if it would fit in a girl's pocket but like you know it fits in my pocket what pocket oh yeah good point they don't have pockets uh but yeah it's so it's, sad i know but it's like <laughs> It's transportable, and then when I want to, I'm like, boom, I have double the screen real estate, and it's a cool, I don't know, it's nice that you can fold it back, and it's just a single screen when you want it to be, or it can be basically a tablet. It's it's a very, I would have said novel idea, and something that I don't know if everyone would sort of benefit from, but I really think that after this, I'm really glad that I bought it, even if I don't keep it for long just to try it out and be like, okay, yeah, this is a, it's a sound idea and it's not sort of like this out, out, out there concept or a mm -hmm. uh, concept product type of thing. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's definitely something that we're going to start seeing more and more of, I think. Um, and I, I honestly wonder which comes first, right? Do we have foldable phones or do we have Apple glasses? Because once we hit Apple glasses that are good enough, why, like, other than, like, the battery needs to still survive a whole day, yada, yada. Uh, yeah. Why have a phone, it's right? True. If yeah. maybe Apple glasses ship with, a, like, a clear piece of glass, and that is your phone's surface, right? When you look at it, you see your oh, phone. Oh, that'd be cool. When anyone else looks at it, they don't see diddly squat, right? That'd be cool. Like, that is essentially where we are going with this technology. Like, I don't need my 17 monitors if I can put my windows wherever I want in my periphery, right? Like, I'm sitting down at my desk, and I, I put windows here, I put windows there. They are no longer constrained to, that like, individual pixels, like resolution does not matter anymore at that point, right? That's the dream, dude. That would be so cool. There are definitely like VR apps that you know are like virtual desktop and everything, but it's limited by the resolution of the of the headset. So mm -hmm. if we get something that you know has a, a density that's good enough to do that, and you could read text and everything just fine, that'll be a cool future, dude. Yeah, we're we're getting close to it. It's coming that's fast. True. Uh, it's yeah. either that or uh the gpt overlords just like decide humans are not worth it yeah um like one of the two uh they still only have a 32 kilobyte memory but like don't test them <laughs> that's right as always i want to personally thank everyone for listening in this week please be sure to follow us on mastodon.social at code completion to know when new episodes go live and feel free to toot at us if there's ever a topic you'd like for us to dig into most importantly, as a small podcast, please be sure to share this with your friends and family who are also interested in any part of the process of app development. It's your support that enables us to continue doing this, and we hope to grow a healthy community around everything we discuss. Once again, I want to give my thanks to Spencer, who is at Spencer C. Curtis, that's S-P-E-N-C-E-R-C-C-U-R-T-I-S, for joining me this week. My name, once again, is Dimitri. You can find me at Dimitri Buniol, that's D-I-M-I-T-R-I-B-O-U-N-I-O-L, and we'll see you all next week. Bye.